Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar about the budget that Governor DeWine introduced last Friday. This is Lori Christ, and I'm here with a team of folks that uh, are going to help us walk through this budget today. And at the end, we'll answer any questions that you submit through the uh, the texting option in the, the webinar capability. So I'll just get started right away. So wanted to just talk about, today we plan on talking about Governor DeWine's investments, what the department's priorities are, and those priorities are in conjunction with Recovery Ohio. And then we'll also be, again, answering questions at the end that you submit in writing. If we run out of time and we don't get to your questions, we'll certainly answer those after the webinar. So as you know, it's um, a, a well-known fact that Governor DeWine prioritizes the mental health and wellness of people with living with substance use disorders and mental illness in the state of Ohio and preventing those conditions for Ohioans who are not um, suffering from them. And so we're really excited about the budget that he has put together. And he has several investment priorities, and we show up in a number of those areas, namely local communities, recovery, and children and families. In his inaugural address, he was the governor was very focused on being pragmatic and doing what we know works, investing in that for the future. And he's, again, very serious about mental health and substance use disorders and eradicating those in Ohio. And he's very serious about supporting kids and families as we move into this work as well. So as we, as we talk today, you'll see that the department is not just interested in funding these initiatives, but we have a strong commitment to supporting the success of these investments with technical assistance and partnerships over the two-year period of, of this budget and beyond. Uh, we will be setting goals for all of these initiatives for us to meet collectively, and there will be accountability for these investments as well. And our focus is, again, on all Ohioans and our priority is flexible um, use of these dollars at the local level so that they can be meaningful investments in every community. This slide comes from the Blue Book, and you'll see that it shows the all funds that are invested in the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Federal funding is definitely increasing over the, the biennium and that's largely due to the state opioid response grants that we're getting from the federal government. You'll see too that dedicated purpose funding is increasing due to several one-time initiatives related to uh, the, the prevention and crisis infrastructure across the state. And you will notice that the GRF increase for 20 and 21 is sustained over the 2019 levels in both of those years as well. The department itself has several priorities, and these are based on the feedback that we've gotten from community partners over the, the past couple of years and through the Recovery Ohio Advisory Committee process. The Recovery Ohio Advisory Committee report was released last week, and it included 75 recommendations in it. The timing of that committee's work was really helpful in that every week it was meeting to identify priority areas and intervention, early intervention and prevention, access to treatment, looking at crisis services, criminal justice involvement, um, and the special needs of, of people who are involved with criminal justice, and also issues around institutional care that, that we provide, either through our state hospital system or through the recovery services in the, the prison system. And so we are giving equal priority to all of these institutional and community uh, parts of the continuum of care. And we are really focused on implementing the recommendations, uh, in part at least, of the, the Recovery Ohio report in this budget. So first, let's talk about intervention and prevention. 
and um, you'll see that we have a significant investment of both ongoing funds and one-time funds in these areas. The first thing to note is the $18 million investment through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services in K-12 prevention education. You'll find this in the statewide prevention and treatment line item 623 in the budget. These dollars will go to local partnerships that are multifaceted with schools, prevention coalitions, uh, community providers, boards, and there will be a collective application to put forward for use of these dollars to promote K through 12 prevention activities that are evidence-based to every student in every school and every community. We are looking at this in collaboration with the Ohio Department of Education, and they will have an additional $2 million of investment that will be professional development for teachers and other school staff so that they can be good partners in this work with us. We're also expanding early intervention and prevention by empowering families and communities uh, through an investment in stigma reduction campaigns. You'll find this in, again, statewide prevention and treatment, line item 623. So what we're doing here is building on the work of partners in the private sector who have developed prevention materials targeting friends and families, and these are market tested and evidence to be effective. And it will help us amplify these multimedia campaigns. So examples of this would be the Family Dinner Project, Parents Who Host Lose Most, more of the, the broader universal approaches to prevention. And then we're also investing in the expansion of the Ohio START program and using this in the context of early intervention and prevention because we're focusing the work um, specifically on the children living with parents who are involved with the, the Children Protective Services System because of parental substance use. This is a program that started over the past couple of years and is currently operating in 34 counties. Our investment will increase it to an additional 30 counties. On this slide, you can see that the general allocation is holding steady for these, um, for expanding early, I'm sorry, for me. <laughs> for evidence-based programs in schools and in general, and for suicide prevention. And uh, we're combining the EBP's general and school categories, so we'll have more local level flexibility in spending. $50,000 will replace the $75,000 that each board received in the past biennium, each year of the past biennium. A new investment that we have is for a small research project to help us do an assessment of treatment capacity in the system. So we will be uh, assessing where there are gaps in, in the continuum, some of that based on the behavioral health workforce shortage, and looking to inform our strategic planning to address those gaps as we move forward. You'll find these dollars in the 504 line. We will be continuing to support workforce development through recruitment, training, and retaining efforts. These dollars are found, again, in the Community Innovations 504 line item. And we will be using a variety of proven approaches to support the workforce development initiative. As we look at the prevalence of mental illness and substance use disorders in Ohio and the need to build the understanding of what the signs and symptoms and risk factors are, we think that citizens are an untapped resource in the behavioral health system. 
And so as we look at the workforce development needs, in addition to the $8 million for the retention and recruitment of professionals, we'll be investing in citizen providers as well. You'll find these dollars in the statewide prevention and treatment, line 623. And we'll be using the $5 million in one-time funding to increasing the skills of faith leaders, librarians, law enforcement, other citizens who are on the front lines every day recognizing the emergent needs of people with mental illness and addiction. We'll also be investing in increasing the capacity for and the efficiency of processing applications in our licensure and certification department. We know that we have a great responsibility to the health and safety of the treatment environments and quality of services that are offered in our community-based uh, settings across the state. And we know that there is a demand for services and we want to keep pace with that demand by making sure that we have a solid process that brings services up quickly to meet those demands. We also have increasing demands coming with um, more OTPs, opioid treatment programs coming online, and in September, all substance use service providers, regardless of payer source, will be required to be certified as well. So we'll be investing these dollars not only to decrease the processing time for current the current application and renewal process, but to handle that increased demand as well. We will be expanding our Take Charge Ohio reach with an investment of $5 million uh, each year to reduce stigma associated with mental illness and addiction. And this website and the resources found there are really aimed at educational opportunities for individuals, families, around parity, how to access uh, treatment and recovery supports, and you'll find these investments in, again, 623 Prevention and Treatment. So we've heard loudly and clearly that our local partners are feeling a great deal of pressure because people in crisis don't necessarily have immediate access to care. And it's, it's heartbreaking for the individuals and the families, the kids, the adults dealing with these crises, but it's also a great deal of pressure on the local first responders, courts, jails, and emergency departments who are doing their best to have a compassionate and competent response to these crises, but they were never really designed for meeting these demands, especially in the volume that they are today. So we're making some investments to be more responsive to families in time of need so that they have a healthcare response that's long-term and, and less of a, a revolving crisis experience. So with this, you will see that we have we are continuing our mental health crisis investment and our substance use disorder with drama management uh, investment that has, was begun in the last biennium. You'll also see that we are increasing the investment in the crisis infrastructure development. And so with that, the, the $12 million over the two years is really meant to help provide the opportunity for local communities to develop a response system that makes sense for the resources they already have available. Some of this might be mobile response teams that go to support families of young people who are in crisis right in the home and help stabilize them there so that they don't need out of home care. Others might be in connection with a local treatment provider or a hospital that has a facility that's able to expand its hours and be more responsive to the specific needs of people with mental illness and uh, substance use disorders when they're in crisis. And it might be even services in jails. We want this to be flexible so that you can design what makes the most sense in your local communities. These next couple of slides kind of walk through those investments specifically. The other thing we'll be doing 
is creating a one-time fund of $10 million that will be used to support people in real time to help stabilize them so that they don't need costly or intensive uh, crisis or inpatient care. These $10 million uh, are really meant to be a flexible fund for communities to use for services that are not covered by Medicaid or other third-party payers. We've intentionally been very broad in how we're describing the use of the funds and who's eligible to access the funds so that we can be supportive of needs that arise for families across the state regardless of their income or um, what other resources they have available to them. We know that a number of people who are in who do have mental illness and substance use disorders do have criminal justice involvement. And despite our best efforts with crisis, this will probably continue to occur. And so we want to make investments in ensuring that when a person does have an engagement with the criminal justice system, that they are getting a healthcare response as well. And so we are investing in collaboration with working in collaboration with the Supreme Court to expand specialty dockets over the biennium. We do have two and a half million in the first year to cover startup costs for at least 15 courts. And then the second year will be a $5 million investment to, for the continuation of those dockets and to bring up an additional 30. We'll also be investing $5 million towards the crisis intervention teams that local police and sheriff's departments operate. And so this is um, the, the same funding that we talked about in the workforce development initiative around citizen providers, but it is specialized to the criminal justice world in that it's directed to CIT officers and, and teams. We will be sustaining our current capacity of almost 1,100 beds in our six state psychiatric hospitals. And we know that that is a, an inpatient opportunity that many individuals and families rely on. And we'll be working um, through policy efforts to increase access to that level of care as well. And finally, in, in some other updates, we learned last week that we are, Ohio is eligible to receive an additional $29.1 million from SAMHSA for the state opioid response grant. And we will get, we will communicate more information on this in our news now as soon as we have more details. We have reached out to SAMHSA to let them know that we would like an opportunity to put together a plan for these dollars that gives us enough time to engage with our community partners so that we use these dollars in the way that's most needed in local communities. We will also have additional investments in problem gambling and the family and children first councils through this budget. And so you'll find that in, in the blue book as well. And so now we'll open it up for questions. If anybody has any specific questions you'd like to ask us. I'm going to take a moment to, to read a couple of questions. So there's, uh, it seems like more of a comment than a question Can you, uh, around the effectiveness of contingency management for working with people with substance use disorders and opiates specifically. So I'll just acknowledge that comment. I know that um, that contingency management is something that's evidenced for uh, supporting people in their recovery from stimulant use as well. That is something that we've started to take a look at through our research department and we'll be looking at in our strategic planning and, um, and other dollars that come in from the federal government. But we didn't have a plan for that in the general revenue fund dollars. Someone asked if there would be copies of the slides available for today's presentation. The slides and the 
a recording of this webinar will be available on our website immediately following the webinar. A question about the source of funding for the start funds. Dan, do you have that handy? I think I do. Is that 421? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the start funds are general revenue funds, line 421, continuum of care. There's a question about the state opiate response, the federal funds, and whether they continue past September of 2019. We do have an additional round of funding that we have not yet gotten the guidance for, and so don't know the specifics of the allowable use of those funds. So we have new dollars coming after September. There is also a carryover request that, that the department is working on for unexpended funds from this year's SOR dollars. So the $29.1 million that SAMHSA contacted us uh, and notified us of the eligibility for late last Friday afternoon is in addition to the carryover and to the new dollars that would be available on October 1st. All right, I'm reading another question. There's a question about whether or not the K through 12 school funding is available to only public schools and if it will be available for private and parochial schools. I've, I've been in conversations with the governor where he's still looking at the investment of these dollars and how we can reach all children in every school, uh, grades K through 12. And so his intention is that we will be having uh, an opportunity to work with non-public schools as well. Sorry, I'm, there's a long question about crisis, so give me a minute here. So there are some people who are already providing crisis services in counties and they are experiencing reduced resources because of some of the redesigned um, work that was done. There's a question about how to get who they would work with to be part of the crisis response design that's available through the dollars that we're proposing in our investment. And those crisis dollars will go to the Adam H boards and so you should be working closely with your Adam H boards on this. With these dollars we will be putting in goals and accountability measures and so uh, the, the plan for these is forthcoming, but you should start talking now about how you'd want to use them. We'll also be providing technical assistance on what we've learned from other crisis response activities across the state of Ohio and nationally so that you can be using um, the standards of care that are evidenced and researched or uh, practice-based as you design these, these programs. There's a question about the application process for the K through 12, $18 million, and whether or not they'll be per competitive or if they'll be allocated across the board areas. We'll be able to tell you more on that um, as the final designs of this investment are involved, but it's, it's, yeah, but we're working with the Department of Education to finalize those details. There's a question about whether or not the local investments are dollars to boards for discretionary use or if they're targeted investments. And they are 
they are targeted investments. So there are specific areas that in connection with the Recovery Ohio recommendations and the priorities of Governor DeWine, we have identified specific targeted investments, but the use of the dollars will still be flexible enough that local communities can invest them in ways that are uh, beneficial to your local area. There's a question about the K through 12 application and if it requires a grant application and a fiscal agent. And again, those are still details that we're working out with the Department of Education. But the goal is that there will be a partnership between the school and the Adam H Board and the local community providers and prevention coalitions. and we want these dollars to be accessible by any community, regardless of who the the structure might be that takes the lead on the project in that in that collaborative way. The, there's a question about the state has a formula that's been used that provides tiers based on poverty and opioid use disorders. And there's a question of whether or not that form formula will be used. And yeah, that was for cures specifically. That's not a formula that we've, we've talked about or contemplated for any of these investments. Will any of the criminal justice dollars be targeted to working with offenders involved in community corrections, and if so, how? So the criminal justice dollars are largely the expansion of the specialized dockets and the CIT officer training. I think as we look at um, the crisis intervention services, there may be opportunities for partnerships of those, those community providers and those collaboratives locally meet some of the needs. There's a question about whether the crisis funding will be regionally or by individual boards, and that's not something that's been finalized yet. The access to treatment dollars, the $5 million um, for the citizen providers, that is a mental health first aid, uh, is one of the strategies that we would find to be allowable. And CIT, yes. So both of those are part of that $5 million investment. We were expecting mental health first aid to be part of that. Are the S, the the SOR dollars, the federal funds restricted to opiate use disorders, they do have a requirement that the funds target interventions specific to opiate use disorders or people with opiate use disorders. And those are federal requirements. Those are not something that we have discretion with at the local level. Though it is a concern that we have voiced to uh, our congressional delegation and to SAMHSA. Okay, I'm gonna do one or two more questions and then we'll we'll wrap since we're at three o'clock. Will the state be providing us with information around evidence-based practices that can be used with these initiatives? Yes, our intention is that we will provide resources on evidence-based practices, research, what works, what doesn't work, uh, for all of these initiatives. And of course, if you have a long-standing evidence-based practice that you're using, we would want to hear about that as well. Yeah, promising practices are included in that too. There was a question about whether the about the fifty thousand dollars per year per county, and that is 
that that line item has been changed so that it's fifty thousand dollars per year per county instead of seventy five thousand per year per county. Okay, we still had a number of other questions that came in. We will document those and provide answers to them and post them on our website with the webinar and the slides themselves. But thanks to all of you for your participation today and we look forward to continuing these conversations and working together to get these initiatives funded. Thank you.